Today we're going to be looking at another one of Nile Red's videos, specifically making Prussian blue, which could actually be used to treat certain types of radiation poisoning. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Tyler Fulce. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry, from engineering to operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. Let's see. For this project, I'll be making Prussian blue, which was one of the first modern synthetic pigments. It's also sometimes referred to as Berlin blue or Parisian blue. <laughs> okay. Structurally, it's made from a mix of iron in its two oxidation states, iron 2 plus and iron 3 plus. The iron 2 plus ion is coordinated with six cyanide groups, and then three of these groups are associated with four iron 3 plus ions. Although it does contain cyanide, it's generally not very toxic because the groups are really tightly bound to the iron. The simplest use for Prussian blue is just as a pigment in things like paint and ink. A more complicated use though is in a process called cyanotyping where it can be used to develop images onto paper. This is how most blueprints were oh, made cool. and it's well why they turned out blue. It can be used to develop almost any image and I think the whole process is really cool. One other potentially surprising use of it is actually as a medicine. Yep. It's apparently quite good at sequestering certain heavy metal poisons in the digestive tract, and it can prevent a lot of it from getting into the bloodstream. This video is going to be the first in a series of three, and for this one, I'm going to be focusing on making and isolating the pigment. So one of the worst types of radiological exposure is an internal dose, because external doses, when you leave the vicinity of whatever radioisotopes emitting that dose, it's done and you don't have to worry about getting more. However, internal doses, they stick with you. So something like cesium-137, which happens to be a common fission product and was probably one of the more challenging products after the Chernobyl accident, has a half-life of about 30 years, so it's one of those that's still around, it would be even worse to take that internally, whether it's inhaled, ingested, or absorbed through the skin. And how it works is that crystal structure that you just saw, its negatively charged lattice sites, it was minus four, attracts and binds the positively charged cesium or thallium or other similarly charged metal contaminant. It binds them in the gastrointestinal tract and you excrete it normally so it doesn't get stuck in your bloodstream. If you didn't use pr Prussian blue, the biological half-life, which is not to be confused with the radiological half-life of cesium-137 is about three months. So three months of getting internal dose. This cuts it to about a week, if even, and that's why it's here. So that's why it's used. And as he showed, it's typically administered in capsule form. In the next two though, I'll be diving into the whole process of cyanotyping. The most common way to make Prussian blue is to mix a ferrocyanide salt with an iron 3 plus salt like ferric chloride. I wanted to make the ferrocyanide myself, but as far as I know, there isn't really an easy way to do it. So I just ended up buying some from eBay. If you do have what you think is a decent method though, you should definitely let me know in the comments. He seems to get everything from either eBay or Alibaba or something. I can make the ferric chloride though, using hydrochloric acid, steel wool, and hydrogen peroxide. The acid and the steel wool are easy to find at the local hardware store, and the peroxide is just from the pharmacy. Yeah. To start off, forward. I added 225 mils of water, followed by an equal amount of concentrated hydrochloric acid. I mixed it around for about 30 seconds, and then I added some small pieces of steel wool. In total, I'll be adding 50 grams of it, but I wanted to start it off slowly just to make sure that the bubbling didn't get out of control. What's happening here is a reaction between the iron in the steel wool okay. and the hydrochloric acid to make iron 2 chloride, also known as ferrous chloride, and hydrogen gas. Mm, releases some hydrogen. The hydrogen gas is the reason for all the bubbling, and it does pose a fire and explosion rate. Yep, um, hoping he's doing this under a fume hood, and he probably is. He's pretty well set up. Risk. Throughout this reaction, this a decent amount of it's is. going to be generated, so it's important to do it in a well-ventilated area where it can't build up. Battery rooms for uh, backup systems in nuclear power plants are well-ventilated. They're, in, um, they're indoors, so they're well-protected, and they each have their own dedicated exhaust fan for the room because they have the potential to release hydrogen gas as well. The reaction seemed to be quite well behaved, and it didn't look like it was going to get out of control, so I just dumped in the rest of the steel wall. 
calm it down with the I time lapsed it over the next okay. nine hours with occasional mixing, and most of it disappeared. The green color of the solution was from the ferrous chloride, but as it progressed, it started to become black. As far as I know, this is mostly just carbon, but there are probably some other sure. impurities because steel wool is not a very high grade steel. No. <laughs> After the nine hours, I stopped the time lapse and I Stuff just let it sit overnight. It. By the next day, the carbon and other impurities had sank to the bottom, but there still was some undissolved steel wool floating on the top. In theory, I could have added more acid to dissolve it and stirred it for something like a day, but for the amount that was present here, I just really didn't think it was worth it. The next step was to get rid of all this undissolved junk, and I did this by just passing it through some I'll coffee look at filters. It green. I like it. It did take a while, but I was eventually left with this nice crystal clear solution of iron 2 chloride. It's pretty. This iron 2 chloride was then oxidized to iron 3 chloride using hydrogen peroxide. In theory, it's also possible to oxidize it by just bubbling air through it, but that process, as far as I know, is kind of slow, and this method is way faster. The moment it was added, this yellowy brown color appeared, which was the iron 3 chloride. In total, I added 550 mils of the 3% peroxide, mixed it around thoroughly, and then poured it into a large dish. I set up a fan off screen, and I yeah, let it evaporate for a couple days. Nice. Then I started scraping it off the dish, and you have even casserole. though it was still a bit wet. It was actually kind of a huge pain, but when I eventually did scrape off everything, I let the loose pieces dry <laughs> for another day. So in total, this entire drying process took about three days, wow. but that's just because I let it air dry. I could have sped it up quite a bit if I put it in my oven. The final yield was 214 grams of iron 3 chloride hexahydrate, meaning that every iron 3 chloride has six water molecules associated with it. Good to know if you have a radiological emergency, you can just stick something in the oven with household materials. <laughs> I know there's a whole vetting pro there's a whole vetting process, FDA process for making any kind of household medicines, but still less than the three month uh, biological half-life though. I transferred it all to a nice plastic container and I was ready to make the Prussian blue. The first step was to actually remake a solution of the iron three chloride. So into this beaker, I added 37 grams and then I filled it with water to around the 50 mil mark. In theory, if I were even lazier than I currently am, I could have just directly <laughs> oh, used the solution lazy. from earlier and skipped the whole evaporation step. The major reason why I didn't do that though was because I didn't know what the exact concentration of iron 3 chloride was and mm. I also wanted to have a proper dry stock of it. Anyway, I let it stir for about 20 minutes but there was still some solid stuff that didn't dissolve. One of the key advantages of using Prussian blue to treat um, cesium-137 ingestion is it starts working right away binds radionuclides that are tr that are present within the gi tract in addition to the blood so if some of it let's say it's been a while ideally you're going to want to try to get treatment as soon as you can but if it's been a couple of days or something it can still be helpful though its main weakness is it's not good for other radionuclides such as say iodine 131 which is another major hazard probably the biggest one immediately after the uh the accident but it decays quickly so only a half-life of about eight days so it's not a hazard at all from chernobyl today for instance that requires a different treatment uh such as potassium iodine tablets which put non-radioactive iodine in your body to get uptaken by your thyroid so it effectively blocks radioactive iodine from getting in the thyroid and risking thyroid cancer so it's all isotope dependent and again it doesn't remove the radiation source the cesium-137 at all it doesn't neutralize it or anything like that that's that's not really a thing you still need to manage the contaminated environment to get rid of it i tried to do a gravity filtration but it was just way too slow so i instead set it up for a vacuum filtration which left me with a really nice and dark solution i dumped it all into a small beaker and I love his labeled beakers and flasks. They're really cool. The bet say now red on them. And I moved on to making the second solution that I needed. This time, I added 13.9 grams of potassium ferrocyanide and again filled it up to around the 50 mil mark. I let it stir for a few minutes and it mostly cleared up, but there was still some undissolved stuff, so I shot in some extra water. I let it stir for a bit longer and when it was crystal clear, I took it off the stir plate. 
I also took out the stir bar, and at this point, I was ready to make the pigment. I'd normally just directly oh, right. poured the iron chloride solution into this, oh, but I instead cool. added it dropwise because I thought it would look cool. The moment it, it was added, it immediately does. formed Rule some little cool. greenish blue donuts of insoluble <laughs> Prussian blue. It also made potassium chloride as a side blue product, donuts. but that just dissolved into solution. From the top, each drop kind of looked like I was making little jellyfish, and I found it was kind of amusing. Kind of does. I continued playing with it a bit, but when I eventually got- There you go, all you gotta do is drink this if you have cesium contamination. <laughs> I'm kidding. It's gonna be tablets in carefully monitored doses that would depend on- that just like any other dosage would depend on the age of the patient as well as the severity of the contamination, which can be measured. That's the nice thing about radioisotopes. It's pretty easy to, rem to measure the dose, right? This would also make the stool blue. Upboard, I just poured in the rest. I stirred it for a few minutes and so much Prussian blue was made that it got quite thick. To separate it off, I just used the coffee filter. Huh? I poured and scraped out as much as I could, and then I washed it? the beaker with a bit of water. When most of the water had filtered through, I added some oh, more just to wash it. Because this reaction used an excess of iron chloride, the first few washings are tainted with this yellow color. Okay. I just kept washing it until it was a greenish blue, which I think took four rounds. I let it sit here for a few hours, and then I put it on some paper towel to dry. It was important to not let it dry completely though, otherwise it would have just stuck to the paper. While it was still damp, it was really easy to lift off, and I transferred everything to a glass paint, dish. Right? I put it in my oven for several hours, and I was eventually left with some nice and dry Prussian blue. Then, I put it all into my mortar, and I crushed it up as best I could. My final yield of the Prussian blue was 17.7 .7 grams. I really wanted to make some paint with it, but at the moment, the grain size was still a bit too big. Mm, okay. It needed to be a really fine powder, so I just put it in my coffee grinder. <laughs> I ground it intermittently for several minutes, and when I took off the lid, there was some Using really nice blue dust. I say. Whoa! I dumped it all out, <laughs> and it honestly still wasn't as fine as I would have liked it to be, but it was more than good enough. There were a lot of different paint types that I could have made, but I figured the easiest was just oil paint. I went to my local art supply store, and this was everything that I picked up. I got some brushes, watercolor paper, a knife, some gesso, and some linseed oil. Before we get started though, I just want to give a disclaimer and say that I don't really know much about art or oil painting and every- I can't say that I do either. My wife's an artist, maybe I should have her watch this portion of the video. <laughs> Everything I, I learned know. was just from some random tutorials. What I'm doing here is mostly just for fun and it really shouldn't be used as a reference. Also, try not to be too harsh on my technique and other stuff. <laughs> in theory, for oil painting, any paper can be used, but apparently the heavy, acid-free stuff works quite well. Regardless of the paper or surface, though... I'm sure this probably goes without saying, but in paint form, I don't recommend ing ingesting it to uh, treat cesium. I'm also not a doctor or a pharmacist, just an engineer that knows about radiation and emergency management procedures. <laughs> it's a good idea to first treat it with something like gesso, which is basically just a paint primer. To do this, it's actually quite easy. I taped down the piece of paper I wanted to use and covered it with a generous amount of gesso. When I felt like I had done a decent job, cool. I let it dry for a few minutes. Then on top of it, I quickly gave it a second coating. One other thing about this is I know people can be sensitive to iron, and this contains a fair amount of iron, so I might want to mention that. The paper slowly started to warp though, so when it was dry to the touch, I lifted some of the tape and did my best to press it down. I then left it overnight, took off the tape in the morning, and it was good to go. Off screen, I prepared two other sheets just like this one, for a total of three. Now to make the paint, the pigment just needed to be mixed with a small amount of the linseed oil. This is one of the simplest ways to make cool. it, and a lot of oil paints are just a straight combination of oil and pigment. From what I saw online, there's a whole Simple proper enough. technique to manually mixing the paint, but I figured it was just the easiest to use a mortar and pestle. <laughs> it seems to work decently well on a small scale, sure, but if you not? want to make more than just the small amount that I did. I like that. So 
One pattern I've noticed with a lot of Nile Red's videos is a lot of, at least the reaction portion, the, uh, the chemical transitions, knows pretty well, but when it comes down to like the painting or the cooking, or this, this portion, it's kind of like, let's just do whatever. I like it, and I appreciate the acknowledgments that he, uh, that he mentions in the video. Here, I really don't recommend it. <laughs> I added about two grams of the Prussian blue, and then I poured in some linseed oil. I mixed it around and it looked like there wasn't enough oil, so I added some more. Unfortunately though, I added way too much and I had to balance it out with more pigment. The final yeah, consistency no of the, the paint right depends is. a lot on the preference of the artist, and I just stopped mm. when I felt it was thick enough. To get it out of the mortar, I just scooped it out with my finger and scraped it into a small beaker. I planned to use it all right away, so this was fine, but if I wanted to store it, I would have sealed it in a paint tube. To test my amazing paint, I decided to draw some chemical oh, structures. Cool. <laughs> this was literally the first time that I had ever done any kind of oil painting, so it was kind of a mess. Just for fun, I think in the comments, it's you cool. guys should try to identify the molecules here. Also, feel free to point out any mistakes that I made, because I almost definitely did. <laughs> in any case, sure. when I was done, I let it dry for a couple days, and this was the final scanned result. Probably better than I could paint. The somewhat success of my first attempt gave me the false confidence that I needed to freestyle something. To be fair, I made it in less than a minute, but it was still extremely disappointing. By the way, I haven't looked at chemical drawings since undergrad, so not even gonna guess. And it looked like something a two-year-old would make. <laughs> I clearly didn't have the skills to work without structure, so I knew I had to follow a tutorial for the next one. A friend suggested a butterfly, so I followed a step-by-step -step guide on how to draw one. Wow, okay. I ended up quitting halfway through <laughs> because it started to get way too detailed and hard for me, but it still turned out a lot better than I expected. I moved on to painting it, and this time I diluted some of the paint with a small amount of turpentine. In the previous attempts, it was a bit too thick and I felt like it might be easier if it were thinned out a bit. I left the top portion of the paint undiluted though, so that I could use a mix of both. I originally planned to try to make the butterfly detailed, but I ended up just coloring it all in. <laughs> when I was done, I let it dry for a couple days, and then I scanned Still it. Still better than anything I could draw. Anyway, that's basically how Prussian blue pigment is made, and how it can be used in paint. To make blueprints though, the process is quite different, and in my opinion, really interesting. Instead of making and isolating the pigment, oh, nice. it's formed directly in the paper. That's cool. It's also a light sensitive process that uses different chemicals. You know what, throughout all the blueprints that I've looked at throughout my career as an engineer, I've never seen any of them that were actually blue. And recently, a lot of them, and recently I very seldomly see them actually printed out, usually just zoomed in and marked up on a tablet. It uses potassium ferrocyanide instead of ferrocyanide and a light sensitive iron compound. Like with this nice. project, I just bought the ferrocyanide, but I made the new iron chemical myself. Pretty. There really wasn't much info out there though, and I ended up just following some random old paper that I found. <laughs> okay, so he did the paint, he did the blueprints, now is he going to do the pills for cesium-137? Thankfully, to my surprise, it actually worked really well, and that's what I'll be covering in the next video. I really hope to have it up within the next week, so definitely keep an eye out for it. Doesn't sound like it. Oh, doesn't look like it. Oh well, thanks so much for the recommendation. And thanks so much for watching. I'll see you next time.